Hi guys. In this video, we'll take a look at the need for differentiation, differentiation from first principles, examples, and then we'll finish with a summary. So why exactly do we need this process called differentiation? Recall that the gradient of a function at a point can be found by working out the gradient of a tangent at that point. Let's suppose we have our function f of x, and we choose a single point and draw the tangent to the curve at that point then the gradient of that function is the same as the gradient of the tangent, which you write as m. And we can calculate this by finding two points on the tangent, one of which is already on the curve and the tangent, where they touch, and one other point. And then for those two points, we can calculate the change in y between these points and divide this by the change in x for these two points. And this gives us the gradient of the tangent and hence the gradient of the function. However, this is a tedious process. Even if you wanted to do this for a lot of different points, we still wouldn't cover every single point on the curve. And this is quite a long process for each point anyway. And so we need a more general method. We can use a more efficient process called differentiation, which we can derive from first principles. So what exactly is differentiation from first principles? Consider the points p and q on the graph of a function f of x. So in general, this is the curve y is equal to f of x for some given function f of x. Let's consider a point, and this point is the point p, which has a x-coordinate of x in general, and hence a y-coordinate of f of x. And then let's consider another point, q, which has an x-coordinate of x plus some number h. So all we've done is to go from this point here with coordinate x at p and travelled some distance h and got to the point x plus h. And similarly, therefore, the y-coordinate will be f of x plus h. A chord, pq, can be made by joining the two points on the curve. So again, we have our point P, which is at x, f of x, and our point Q, which is at x plus h, f of x plus h. And then we can join these two points up with a line, and this line is called a chord. In particular, the chord PQ, since it joins up the points P and Q. The gradient of this chord can be written using the formula of a gradient from a straight line. Usually we have that m, the gradient of a straight line, is equal to y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Well, in this case, we're going to take p as our x1, y1, and q as our x2, y2, and therefore y2 is f of x plus h, and y1 is going to be f of x, and similarly, x2 is going to just be x plus h, and then x1 is just x. By simplifying the denominator, we get as our numerator f of x plus h minus f of x divided by just h. Since x plus h minus x is just h. As q gets closer to p, we see that the gradient of the chord also gets closer to the gradient of the tangent at p. Here we have this point p, which is x, f of x. We've also drawn on the tangent to the curve at the point p. Let's let q1 be the point we were discussing earlier, x plus h, f of x plus h. We can draw on the chord between p and q1, and then we can bring the point Q1 slightly closer towards P. Let's let the point Q2 be here, for example. And then we can form a chord between P and Q2. And then let's bring it even closer. Let's let Q3 be here. And then we can join up P and Q3 using a chord. So as it goes from Q1 to Q2 to Q3, and so on, bringing this point Q closer and closer to P, the chord becomes closer and closer to being the tangent line. When considering points closer and closer to P, 
we are considering smaller and smaller h. So at the tangent, h approaches zero. Again, we have our points q1, q2, q3, and of course our point p. Now remember that for q1, this was the point x plus h, f of x plus h. And so as q approaches p, this corresponds to h getting closer and closer to zero. This is because as h gets closer and closer to zero, x plus h gets closer and closer to x, which gives us q going towards p. And so this corresponds, as q approaches p, to h tending to zero. As the distance h approaches zero, our gradient tends to that of the tangent to the curve. So as the value of h tends towards zero, our gradient of that chord, which we found above, as f of x plus h minus f of x over h, this tends towards the gradient of the tangent, and hence the gradient of the curve. We can describe this process as finding the limit of the gradient of the chord as h tends to zero. We denote this process of finding this limit as h tends to zero. We write the limit, lim, and then we write h tending to zero. This process is known as differentiation from first principles. So we have that our function for f prime of x, the gradient function, can be found by taking the limit as h approaches or tends to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. We can then define f prime of x as the derivative of the function f of x. We've seen before that f prime of x is the gradient function of f of x. But in this context of differentiation, we also call the gradient function the derivative. We can also write this function f prime of x as f prime on its own, or also we sometimes write it as y prime, or also sometimes we write dy by dx. Differentiation from first principles can be used to find the derivative of simple polynomial functions. So for example, we can find the gradient function or derivative of the functions x squared plus 2x minus 5, or for example, x to the power of 3, or for example, x minus 3x squared. Let's take a look at some examples. Our first example asks us to prove that f prime of x equals 2x plus 1 for f of x equals x squared plus x using differentiation from first principles. Our first step is to recall the method of differentiation from first principles. Differentiation from first principles corresponds to taking our f prime of x and the formula for this gradient function is the limit as h tends to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Our second step is to find f of x plus h. We have been given that f of x is x squared plus x. And therefore, we can find f of x plus h just by substituting in. And so we get that f of x plus h is equal to x plus h all squared plus x plus h. Our third step is to substitute into the equation for f prime of x and simplify. And so by substituting in, we have that f prime of x is equal to the limit as h tends to zero of our f of x plus h, which is x plus h all squared plus x plus h. That is our f of x plus h, and then we minus f of x, which is x squared plus x. And then we divide by h. This is going to be equal to the limit as h tends to zero of the following. By expanding out the first bracket, we get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then we have a plus x plus h. And then from the minus, we have a minus x squared and a minus x. And then all of this is divided by h. 
and then we can perform some simplifications and we get the limit as h tends to zero of, let's have a look, x squared cancels with x squared and x cancels with minus x. So all we're left with is 2xh and then we have a plus h squared and then we have a plus h and this is still divided by h. Our fourth step is to find the limit as h approaches zero. So we have our f prime of x and by dividing the inside of this limit by h to the numerator, we're going to get the following. We have the limit as h tends to zero and our first term is a 2x. Our second term, h squared over h is just plus h. And our third term is plus h over h, which is a plus one. This is all inside the limit. And then quite simply, as h tends to zero, since two x and plus one are not dependent on h, they will be completely unaffected by the limit. And then the limit as h tends to zero of h is zero. As h tends to zero, h tends to zero. And therefore we only end up with two x plus one. One. Again, it's kind of an obvious thing. If we look at only our plus h, since 2x and the 1 are unaffected by the limit, as h tends to 0 as part of our limit, the quantity h tends to 0. And so in the limit, it is 0, and therefore it disappears, and we get our derivative f prime of x is equal to 2x plus 1. Our second example asks us to prove from first principles that the derivative of the function f of x equals 3 is 0. Our first step is to recall the method of differentiation from first principles. We have that f prime of x is equal to the limit as h tends to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Our second step is to find f of x plus h we have that f of x is equal to 3. And therefore, f of x plus h is also going to be equal to 3. This is because since f of x is equal to 3, if we substitute x plus h everywhere we see an x, we still have 3. And similarly, f of x is the constant function 3. And so when you put in x plus h, you're still going to have 3 as the output. Our third step is to find the derivative f prime of x. By using our formula, we have that f prime of x is equal to f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h, and then we take the limit as h tends to zero. And so we have the limit as h tends to zero, and then we have our f of x plus h minus our f of x divided by h. So of course this is the limit as h tends to zero, and by working out the numerator, we have zero over h. And therefore, no matter what, this limit is going to be zero. And so the derivative of f of x when f of x is equal to three is zero. And again, we can see this by looking at the graph of f of x. f of x is equal to three everywhere. And therefore, the gradient is zero just by looking at taking a, any point on this curve and then drawing the tangent line. You just have this line, and therefore the gradient is zero. Our last example asks us to find, our last example tells us that given that y equals two x cubed plus four x, we're asked to find dy by dx using differentiation from first principles. Our first step is to recall the method of differentiation from first principles. We have that f prime of x is equal to the limit as h tends to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Our second step is to find an expression for f of x plus h and simplify it. We have that our f of x is equal to 2x cubed plus 4x. And therefore, our f of x plus h is going to be equal to 2 lots of x plus h all cubed plus 4 lots of x plus h. Now if we split up our x plus h all cubed into x plus h 
multiplied by x plus h, multiplied by x plus h, and if we expand it all out, we get the following. Of course, we still have our 2, and then we end up with x cubed plus 3 lots of x squared h, and then plus 3 lots of x h squared, and then we have a plus h cubed. Definitely try expanding that out for yourself if you haven't done something like that before. And then we have our plus 4 lots of x plus h. If you've seen binomial expansion before, then you'll be very familiar with this kind of process of this expansion. And then by expanding this out, we're going to get 2x cubed, and then we have a plus 6x squared h, and then we have a plus 6xh squared, and then we have a plus 2h cubed, and then we have a plus 4x and a plus 4h. Our third step is to find f of x plus h minus f of x and simplify the expression. If we look at our f of x and try to identify f of x within our f of x plus h, then we can perform the subtraction rather easily. Well, f of x plus h is this long expression here, and we can identify the terms in f of x, which is 2x cubed plus 4x. We have the 2x cubed here and the 4x here. And therefore, by subtracting, f of x plus h minus f of x is going to be equal to the remaining terms after identifying the ones in f of x. The remaining terms are the unhighlighted ones. And so we have our first term is 6x squared h. And then we have a plus 6xh squared. And then we have a plus 2h cubed. And then we have a plus 4h. Our fourth step, therefore, is to find dy by dx. We're asked to find dy by dx. And this is just some different notation for f prime of x. And of course, by our above formula, this is equal to the limit as h tends to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And so here we have our 6 x squared h plus 6 x h squared and our plus 2 h cubed and then our plus 4 h. This is our f of x plus h minus f of x and then we're dividing this by h. And so this is the limit as h tends to 0. Let's perform the division of 6 x squared and then we have a plus 6xh, and then we have a plus 2h squared, and then we have a plus 4. And the way to do these limits is any term containing a h, i.e. h or h squared, will be 0 in the limit. And so when performing the limit, these two terms will disappear, and we'll end up with only our 6x squared and our plus 4. Now, this process has been very long to do, and we'll see soon enough how to do these kinds of differentiation with a simple formula. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level math resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snappy by smiley face, and together, let's make A-level maths a walk in the park.